Hello and welcome to this new episode. We're gonna go into the age of cancer today. Previous episodes, we went into Carl Jung, the unconscious, and Carl Jung and individuation. And now we're gonna head into the first age. So, before starting off uh, with this age, I can already say that we're gonna go into the hunter-gatherer base and then uh, dive deeper into the Great Mother. But then coming to why I am talking about um, the Age of Cancer, but also going into the Earth Mother and um, kind of like the Earth Mother spirituality and the different cults associated with, uh, with it. Uh, similarly, also the um, hunter-gatherer cults for both men and women that were there um, is to paint a good base of everything what is yet to come within the other ages. And um, I'm gonna create this thorough base and then from that build the, um, the rest. So this is like the foundation. And then uh, I will be referring back to uh, this age throughout the other ages as well. But let's dive into the hunter-gatherers and go back to Tepe. So to start off, uh, we can start off here with the animistic shamanic hunting rituals. There's obviously like hunting is seeing the future kind of reference and the myth of Prometheus linked to fire. And a kind of like this idea of hunting, fire, and intellect being linked. And then there is also here what you can see the hunting uh, party example from the Maasai as well. But maybe go a little bit more um, into the underlying base. So in many hunter-gatherer societies, um, hunting was considered a sacred and magical activity. And animal spirits were often revered as powerful beings that could help or harm hunters. In many cases, hunters would perform rituals and make offerings to these spirits in order to gain their favor and ensure a successful hunt. These spirits, but also these hunting and um, sacred and magical activities uh, were also often associated with an agriculture or nature goddess. And um, as society shifted towards agriculture and animal husbandry, these traditions of hunting magic began to evolve into more general forms of shamanism in some cultures and animism leading into paganism, where spirits were seen as existing in all, um, in all aspects of the natural world. However, you know, in many cases, the connection between hunting and warfare remains strong, as both involve the use of weapons and physical prowess. You know, in, in many cultures, uh, the deities associated with hunting or the wilderness gradually, you know, also became associated with war and battle as well. And a good example for this is in the Roman tradition, where Mars was originally a god of um, agriculture and fertility, but came to be associated with war and the military as well. Similarly, in Norse mythology, the god Odin was associated with both hunting and warfare, and the berserkers, um, you know, the fierce warriors who wore wolf skins or bear skins and fought with the frenzied furry, were seen as embodying the wild animalistic spirit of the hunt. You know, and overall, the link between hunting and warfare is a common thread that runs through many different cultural traditions and is often reflected in the myths and legends of deities and heroes that are associated with these activities. And in the Age of Gemini video, uh, we'll be going uh, much deeper into, um, into this. But um, I've already also want to bring up this Maasai hunting party example as well to really show that this um, 
underlying hunter-gatherer base um, is not just Indo-European or Proto-Indo-European. There is a shared base that um, is there for all of humanity. And, you know, in the case of the Maasai hunting party, it's about a delegation of boys between 14 and 16 years of age that go on a journey within their lands. uh, And this journey is taken with the company of a group of elders who guide them. Before the ceremony, boys have to sleep outside in... um, outside the village in the savanna and the following day when coming back they have to wear white robes and dance all day long and um, this ritual is uh, meant for the boys uh, to transition from a boy to a transitional uh, phase and to eventually be re-welcomed into the um, society, the, the tribe and to actually become a man of the tribe in in, uh, in that sense and there's both these rituals for men that you can find but also for women that like in the age of gemini episode i will go uh, much deeper into and these uh, rituals are partly it's a base for the gobekli tepe um, and katal temple complexes but At the same time, they still continued uh, alongside the central ritual complex, like the one in Gobekli Tepe. So, now about Gobekli Tepe, Turkey. Um, Yeah, so this complex is from 11,500 before Christ. And the anthropological studies uh, make it clear that the um, totemism and clan kinship across hunter-gatherer bands... Uh, united in a funeral and ancestor cult and there's also a lot of great modern symbolism in Gobekli Tepe as well and there's a lot of figurines found as well depicting the great modern regarding the hunter gatherer symbolism as well you can here see also a lot of the symbolism on pillars as well regarding the um, different animals you know and the the megaliths had representations of snakes, lions, scorpions, spiders, boars, and particularly vultures. Different animals also predominated in different uh, enclosures, how they're called. And in enclosure A, for instance, it's dominated by snakes. Enclosure B, by wolves. Enclosure C is dominated by boars. And all of them have vultures. And, you know, the, the emphasis on some animals rather than others connected by vultures, because, you know, they, they had that in, in all of them, it was suggested by the anthropological sources that it, it, this kind of indicates totemism and clan kinship across hunter-gatherer bands. And uh, there's both the, this funeral ancestor cult symbolism there uh, with these T-shaped pillars, but at the same time, there's this... Um, you know, animal symbolism there and as in a central great modern cult as well. You know, regarding like the animal symbolism of some of it, uh, at least what we can go into, uh, you can see with like the snakes on there that there's, there's a lot of symbolism regarding the transformation, life, death and the unknown with snakes. With lions, protector spirits are kind of like how they're generally seen and they also symbolize the sun and fire then... There's also the scorpions, and uh, they're often associated with the underworld and death, and then spiders are often associated with the trickster, and they can also symbolize death and the underworld as well. Uh, Similarly with boars, it's often associated with agriculture, hunting, and the underworld. And then vultures uh, are generally connected to death, decay, and transformation, and again, like an underworld um, connection. And there's partly a link there regarding the ancestor cult, but also it's an aspect of the great mother cult in of itself as well. And you can uh, later see why. You might be like, well, the great mother archetype is not explicitly represented in, in these kind of figures, but you know, the idea of an ancestral funerary cult and the emphasis on death and decay are like um, one part of like, you know, the cycle of life and death. And it's more the the death part, but then the life part is also uh, very much present in Gobekli Tepe. This is the um, 
one of these enclosures that you can see here as well and one of these figurines uh, there's an example of it and you can see here uh, her seated with two lions in its symbolism that you will uh, later see uh, as well appearing in traditions that seem to have come out of Gobekli Tepe itself because this kind of symbolism continued well after Gobekli Tepe you know it is known from the Mother of the Mountain, how she was called. This is from later than Gobekli Tepe, but it very much links to Gobekli Tepe as well, regarding the symbolism that can be found there. And the Mother of the Mountain was seen as a mediator between boundaries, you know, such as the known and unknown, the civilized and the wild, the worlds of the living and the dead. And this kind of similar symbolism is present in that as well. Regarding the Mother of the Mountain, there is also a shamanic link as well, With uh, like I pointed out in the first episode regarding the shaman dress, how the male shamans uses it to embody uh, the feminine, but um, the, the original shamans were women, and they uh, would use this to connect to the deeper layers within themselves, linked to the Mother Goddess, so the self. So it brings it to a deeper level than how it would be with man. At the center of Temple D we see two pillars uh, that I will also show in the next slide. These pillars can be seen as symbolizing birth uh, as the standing position of the pillars are same as Inanna's, um, you know, hand on Omphalus, so the navel, and it can be seen on both of them. And uh, the fact that there are two of them hints at the origin of the cult of Sibel. This pair of pillars can be seen as the first samples of gods and goddesses in human history. And these two pillars symbolize the goddess and god couple. In addition to this, the second center pillar, uh, which has no sun moon uh, sign, includes a bull symbol. And you can also see that in the, on the right, also this kind of symbolism where there's a snake and bull coming together, symbolizing the underworld, but also the, um, the womb in some sense too, which we will go into uh, just in a bit. Like I said, this is just uh, another picture here of the, um, one of these pillars, which is at the center of the enclosure. In the anthropological sources, they have been linked to Inanna, and also an Egyptian link has been made connecting this to Hathor as well, especially with the bull symbolism. Then regarding the bull symbolism, you can here see here on the left the Krania uh, bull symbolism from the Samo Trace temple complex, which is a Thracian temple complex. And I depict it because of the obvious symbolism in it. The second center pillar, which has no sun-moon sign, includes a uh, Cranium symbol as Schmidt notes. Yeah, so bull or Taurus symbols were seen um, in ancient times as a symbol of fertility and productivity um, since the beginning of civilization, basically. And this sign uh, may represent the uterus of the Earth Mother, you know, again connected to fertility and productivity. What is also important to add is regarding the womb that the womb really, you know, later um, it became symbolically the cauldron and um, the holy grail as well in like the more Arthurian myth. But the, um, the cauldron is also this uh, symbolism that uh, is also associated with the Tuatadanan as well that will be uh, way later still uh, be talking about in the age of uh, Pisces. But the... Um, this kind of like links back to the age of cancer, the cauldron links back to the womb. And the, the womb is, like I said, um, depicted uh, through this imagery of the bull. And um, it kind of represents the ever-shifting uh, mutable force that hosts and um, houses all life uh, within the divine feminine, within the... Um, the womb of creation, uh, you could see it like that. But similarly, it also 
um, links to the cycles of death and rebirth within ourselves, but also within nature. And um, it yeah connects that also symbolically also with the cycles of the moon, but also the seasons. And you can see here also uh, this example regarding the solar bull worship in Egypt, uh, an example, and then similarly with Gobekli Tepe as well. 